I started yesterday to talk about certifiability and automata, and up to now we haven't seen any certifiability question and no, no, no real automata. Uh, what we did, so we, we are talking about guarded fixed point logic with, uh, well, with possibly with, with click guards, and uh, we have seen the model checking game for this logic, and then we discussed about some way to transform models so that uh, truth of formula doesn't change. So we somehow have a way to, to pass from uh, a relational structure to a tree that carries all information that we need to win an Ehrenfurcht-Kassi game on this structure. And now we will try to combine this to get satisfiability procedures. So the idea is to use a trick that uh, worked already well for Rabin's um, procedure for deciding satisfiability of an MSO formula over trees. And uh, it goes like this. So we take the formula and transform it into an automaton that accepts all the models. Here we talk about three models. And then we just check whether the automaton has an empty language. And if this is the, not the case, then we know that the formula is satisfiable. And uh, usually we also, I mean, the techniques of this kind, we also get regular models. The secret is that, so the automaton generates a model in a finitary way, and this, this will give us a, a standard model. OK. Now, uh, we are very close to, to doing something like this, because we have a model checking game already. So the idea will be to, to construct an automaton that um, accepts if the verifier wins the model checking game. And uh, the only problem that is left is that we are talking about arbitrary relational structures and not about trees. And this we will delay a bit. So at the moment, we focus on this. We want to build an automaton that accepts okay, a tree. And we will take a tree that represents the structure that we have in mind well enough. So we start with the unraveling tree if and only if the verifier wins the, uh, the, the model checking game, the structure and the formula. OK. So uh, what kind of automata will we use? The automata will, will run on three decompositions. So something like what we have seen in the uh, pictures of Anush this morning. So we have uh, little structures in the bags labeled on the nodes. And then we have, uh, OK, sorry. Yeah, but then we have some overlap information. So in, in abstractly, we will have automata then that run over trees that have labels on the edges on the vertices. We have these two alphabets. And then uh, they are alternating. We have existential states and universal states. And the transition function looks at, um, at the state and uh, at the label of the current node in the tree. And then it goes, uh, uh, well, then it proposes some, some moves. And the moves, they go into a certain direction. This is the delta. And put a, a state there. And uh, it will be an automaton with a parity acceptance condition. So we will. OK, you can do different things with this. OK, uh -huh. yes. So we run on infinite trees. And uh, what we will want is that uh, on, a on a path, along a path, the parity condition is satisfied. So uh, concretely, the acceptance of a tree is defined, again, as a game. That's a parity game. And the positions, they are pairs of a state and uh, a, a node in the tree. And existential positions are those where the state is existential. Then we copy, I mean, the, the uh, priorities from the state component into the game. We start at the initial state at the root, and then 
whenever we meet, for example, an existential position, I mean, we are at an existential state at some node in the tree, and then we read the label, and uh, then according to the label that we have there in the current state, Alois can choose a transition which gives her a direction and a new state. Then she chooses an outgoing edge, so we are on a tree, on a directed tree, as we go to some successor uh, labeled with this direction and mm, switch to this new state and at, at the successor node. Okay, and uh, so the alternation goes this way that if the state is universal but not existential, then it's the second player that uh, chooses, right, chooses the transition and the successor to which to go. Okay, so uh, this gives us, I mean, once we have an automaton at three, yes, we have, we have such a game, and then we say that the automaton accepts the tree. If uh, Alois wins this parity game. Okay, now, so we want to do it in such a way that we get exactly the model checking game that we have defined yesterday. So what we will take as node labels are the small structures that we put in the bags of the tree decomposition. And the directions are subsets of the universe, I mean the universe with of size k. And in the, in the direction, we record which part of the universe we keep firm. So what of the, OK, so. Um, well, if we de define the, the transitions the way we defined the moves in the game, I mean, these are things that depend on the current formula, and uh, we can just translate them into the language of the automaton, then we will we'll get here an automaton that accepts exactly if the verifier won the game, the model checking game. OK, so now we have a model checking automaton in the sense of the Rabin theorem. The problem is that we, we don't work at all on, I mean, the trees on which we work are quite complicated objects. So we, we require that these trees ca come out of the uh, unraveling of some structure. Yes? Yes. Yes. So it's not an algorithm yet, because I mean, this would work also for an infinite structure. So we, what we do, we, we take the guarded tuples and we arrange them on a tree. And we, we copy the neighborhood, the guarded neighborhood of every tuple that we find. So we will have a branching that is as big as the structure. And so, so it's clear how to, I mean, you can define this, uh, this tree, but uh, I mean, it's, a, it's more, like, more like a concept at the moment. OK, so to know that we work on really on uh, unraveling, well, we need, on the one hand, this consistency. So it needs to be a decomposition in the sense that if it says that the structure that I describe in this node and the one that is I describe in the successor overlap on certain nodes, then I must find the same atomic information on this substructure. But on the other hand, there is a, so a difficult richness condition and which says that if I look at a neighborhood, and, uh, well, I, I look at a guarded tuple and I take its neighborhood here. And then I take a path on which I keep certain elements firm. So I will, I will find descriptions of the same, of the same, I mean, of elements that I have here already. Then, I mean, here I kept, so on the deep part, I mean, on, on, a, on, this, on the part that I kept, constant on, on this way, I must have the same neighborhood. So this comes naturally when I take a, a concrete graph and I unravel it. I mean, I will always find the same successors whenever I hit the same, uh, same node. But if I just see an unraveling, I will not be able to, to check with automata that, uh, that I have isomorphic uh, subtrees whenever I, I need them. Right? So you cannot check whether uh, your input is regular, so your input is, is regular. So at the moment, we are still then quite conceptual. We, we didn't get really far. So what we need is 
to get rid of, of this consistency condition. And here the idea is to say, OK, if you give me an input from which I can recover some structure, I will just talk about that structure. I mean, I don't care that the input is really the unraveling. I just require that from the input I can recover something. And then this is what I'm talking about. OK, so uh, instead of unraveling trees, I will take arbitrary decomposition trees. And we alluded yesterday already to them. So I say a tree is a k-decomposition of a structure. I mean, this k is already in, in the way the, the tree is described. I mean, it's in the, in the alphabet of the tree. And so. But if I can recover something from the tree, and I get something guarded be similar to my original structure. So all the, all the representations that, when glued together, give me something that looks like my original structure, I mean, up to guarded to be simulation, I call it decomposition. And uh, well, the point is that to have, I mean, to know whether something is, I don't want to point all the time, to know whether something is a Cadian composition tree, I just have to check consistency, and that's something easy. So it's local. Uh, the problem is that now I destroyed the neighborhood relation. So before, <coughs> I looked at the guarded top and I found everything around it in the successors. And now it might be spread something. So all I know is that if I glue together the bags, I will find the neighborhood. But these bags, they can, I mean, the information that, that comes in the bags can be spread wide over the tree. So there is no bound on how long I can talk about a, um, um, a tuple. So, well, we don't have adjacency anymore, but instead we have some locality in the sense that, I mean, as long as I talk about the same elements, I mean, about something that will, will be contracted to the same element in my recomposed structure, I have to follow directions that, that fix this element. So in the end, well, no, it's not that. So now we have a much thinner representation. And the property that, um, well, all the information about a guarded tuple lives somewhere in, in a subtree. So I will have to walk for a finite amount of time until I, I can collect the information that I need. And uh, so an automaton that can, I mean, walking would not necessarily mean that I am here and I walk down to find, um, I mean, OK, I will say a bit more about what information means. So I, to find my extension type, it also can mean that I already moved down here. But the, the information that I look for, I mean, that I need in the next step will be here. So I will have to go up and down again. OK. So when I mean I, I'm collecting information from the structure, I mean something uh, to, to give values, I mean, to, to assign to, to formula, uh, to quantifiers. So for example, I mean, I don't need a structure except when I'm evaluating atoms, but that is easy. I mean, this is in the small pieces. And I also, so when I really need a structure is when I have something like uh, there is an extension of a current valuation of variables that has some property, okay? So when I quantify, then I need to do something about the structure. And it's sometimes me and sometimes it's the other player who does it, okay? So to know what to do with such formula, I mean, when, when I'm, I'm here at this point and I have to, to to assign something to uh, in return of an existential quantification, then I may need to, to go and find the extension type of my x somewhere else in the graph. Okay. Now, uh, this is my new automaton. So it runs two-way. And what it means to run two-way, I mean, syntactically, it looks exactly the same as uh, an ordinary one-way automaton. But um, when we play the acceptance game, I mean, before we said if you have a, a transition into a direction D, then you have to go to a successor. Now you, you say you go to a neighbor. 
So you can go to a D predecessor, for example. Or you can also stay where you are. So that's also another thing. Because, I mean, if you stay where you are, then it's sure that you keep, uh, so you keep all the, the variables in, in place. Uh, sorry, all the elements in place. So you overlap with, you always overlap with your current position. So this will always be possible, yeah? So unlike the, the classical automaton, this can stay in its place and just move, I mean, just switch states without really advancing on the tree or walk around in the tree. And um, well, this model has been looked at before, and it, it turns out that uh, emptiness can be checked in X time. So what is relevant here is uh, the number and state and also the, the size of the edge label alphabet. <coughs> now, we can take our old automaton that did Mm, model checking relying on, on, on richness of the structure. So they just took the, uh, the local information from the successors and uh, adapted to the, what the two-way automaton can do. And so we want now to talk about these poorer structures. So what we will do when we have uh, quantifiers then instead of going to a, a successor that keeps in place well, the variables that need to be kept in place and uh, evaluates, I mean, assigns new variables. Um, so instead of doing, going to a D successor, we will send the automaton along a D path. So it can go up and down in a tree and find what it needs. So this is safe up to here. Now, uh, well, the only thing that can go wrong is that uh, a player uh, pretends to go looking for, an, for a witness, I mean, for an extension, and goes up and looks, searches, and then searches somewhere else. I mean, just doesn't want to admit that cannot satisfy a certain property. And to prevent this, we assign two new priorities. So we will say, uh, like, staying infinitely long in the, in the, in the, with an existential formula in search of a variable assignment, this is, uh, well, um, will give you um, odd priority. So if you do, if Lois does this, if the verifier does this, then she will lose because of the parity condition. So here you can also see how handy it is to, to have parity conditions because we had some infinitary conditions and we can put something on top of, of them. So we will do the usual fixed point valuation and uh, the priorities will run for them, but I mean, for the existential and universal quantification part, we will have two new priorities, and uh, well, they they uh, they will not interfere with the others. Okay, so now what we have is we we have an automaton that, if we are given a tree that is just a decomposition tree, so consistent but not necessarily rich, then uh, we accept it if it is a model. If the recomposition of this, uh, this should be a fracture A, if the re recomposition of this tree is a model. Okay. And uh, this is not too complicated to construct, so it's well, basically it's exponential in, uh, in the width and linear in the size of the formula. Okay, so what we still need is to check uh, consistency, but this is not something complicated, so as I said, it's something local. And uh, so we can do it with a deterministic automaton that is about, uh, I mean, exponential in the width. And, um, and then we have the automaton that is as good as the one in Rabin's proof. So we have an automaton that uh, accepts exactly the compositions of models. And well, you now we are done with the with the satisfiability test. So um, we get something double exponential for the Gardner's fragment as long as we allow formula of arbitrary width. But if we fix it, or we, if we are in the Gardner's fragment where the width is fixed uh, by the vocabulary, then we are in X time. Okay. Uh, okay. 
Now, if we look at the construction in a bit more detail, uh, well, it, it again gives us uh, a tree model property. I mean, well, this is, uh, I mean, what we accept is, is a tree that is a K decomposition. So, uh, yeah, if we have a model, it will be one that we can recompose to one of with K. But also, um, we can say something about the branching degree of of the of the decomposition tree. And here, I mean, the idea is that the decomposition tree cannot branch farther than we have states in our automaton. And that is because, I mean, if we think of the acceptance game, so the fact that we accepted an input that we we took it as a model was because the verifier had a winning strategy. But these winning strategies, they can be memoryless. So we need to distinguish at every node of the tree, at most, as many um, successors. I mean, we, well, we, we meet. So at a certain, yeah, if, if we look at the place in the tree, what alloys should do, I mean, depends on in which state we are. So if we keep one choice for every state, so this will be the choice in case it was in 177, then we can discard all the other edges that we had uh, at this node. Yeah. And we will still have a model. I mean, if Alois was able to win in this game with, with few edges, it will, uh, she would have won with the many as well. So, um, It, well, I don't know uh, if it is that fascinating, but uh, well, we get for very cheap uh, a special model property. Okay. Now, the question is how to, how, how to turn this into an algorithm for finite satisfiability. Um, and well, why do we need it? So we can express infinity axioms. Actually, we, all, we even don't need the guarded fragment for that. Already in the mu calculus with backwards modalities, you can say that a relation is well-founded. So you can only run uh, backwards for a finite amount of time. And well, we can, we can come up with an infinity axiom on basis of this, so we can say that uh, we have at least an edge and we can always extend an edge in such a way that once I reach the target of the extension and I go backwards on edges, I must hit a node that doesn't have a predecessor. So I, I'm well founded in this reverse direction of the edges. So this means that in my structure, uh, I, uh, well, I, I will have at least an infinite pass. So if this is so, if, if our formula can ask for generating more and more elements in the model, how can we detect it? And this is relevant because, I mean, for example, if you have database application, you're happy if you can prove that something holds for all finite databases so that you don't find a finite database that is a counterexample of a property, for example. And in the case of the mu calculus with backwards modality, this was already solved uh, a while ago. And it's a very nice argument. So uh, it goes like follows. It says, if you give me um, So if you give me a regular input tree, I mean, this is something like a, I mean, this can be seen as a, as a regular structure. So, and I look how the model checking game goes on, on this tree. So, you know, in the model checking game, 
if you look at the path, it will happen that you see good priorities. So for example, your alloys, yeah, you see a, a small even priority. So you see priority four. And then you see some bad priorities, like five. And now you're scared that you will never see anything lower. So if it goes on like with fives, then you're sunk because you, you should have a, a smallest uh, odd priority. But then the four comes again. And then the thing is branching. I mean, it depends on what uh, the other player does. But on every path, you should see only finitely many bad priorities between two good priorities. And um, now, I mean, the criterion that tells us whether we have to, we work, I mean, we, we deal with something that corresponds to a finite structure or not, is that if you are on a finite, I mean, if you, if you work on the unraveling of, of a finite model, then you will not, I mean, the, the bad times are bounded. So there is a uniform bound over all the, of all the paths of how long the bad segments are. And uh, well, as long as we know that we are talking about regular runs, this will be something we can express in MSO. Now, again, I mean, regularity we cannot check. But to make this work for us, what we can do is not run on, 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 arbitrary, on, on trees anymore, but run on graphs. And running on graphs, I mean, we can run on graphs because we have an automaton that can go any, to any neighbor. So the fact that we have a graph is, I mean, syntactically, there's nothing that stops us. Semantically, running on the graph and running on the unraveling, it's the same thing. Now, um, uh, but we have the advantage that if we, if we run on a, on a graph, we know that our run will correspond to a run on a regular tree. So we will have only finitely many isomorphics. And uh, well, that's all we need. I mean, then we have this MSO property, and then we're done. Okay. So the idea is that as long as we speak about graphs, we know how to so to to solve. I mean, okay, we speak about graphs in the language of only mu calculus. Yes, we don't do anything more complicated. But then we can we can answer the finite identifiability problem with this simple trick. Uh, I mean, just looking at, at the graph representation of our inputs. Okay. Uh, so, but still we are not done. I mean, at that point it seemed like the problem was, was solved. And I mean, even Miko I, who, uh, who has done this, uh, has written it in a paper that now, I mean, the rest is easy. But it turns out that um, in what we have, so here, if we are here in the world of graphs, and then, okay, somewhere among the graphs, there are the trees. So, and here we have relational structures. I mean, arbitrary structures. Uh, they include the graphs, but they, they have a different signature, so. So what we did, was represent a structure as a graph by taking the quotient of the ehrenfeld fresse game, basically. And then, uh, well, we had something that could take us from certain graphs, namely from trees, back to structures. So this was the recomposition, I mean, the recovering. Uh, so it was the structure of a tree that brought us back here. And actually, it brought us back to something of, of small width. So this is width k and less. Okay. And then, uh, well, this part was easy. So we got unraveling trees. I mean, if we had a graph to, get, to go to something that we can recompose, we had to unravel. Now, <clears throat> so what we have with the, with the 
uh, case, what the LMU approach gives us, and these automaton uh, on graphs give us, is um, a way to, to tell that there are finite graphs. So these are the finite graphs. that I can unravel, and then I will get a model. But nobody tells me that, I mean, if I take a finite graph, unravel it, it will be an infinite tree, and then recompose it to a model, then I will get something finite. And I mean, if you, if you try to do it by hand, you understand why it works, but, uh, well, wh why it, uh, why it is difficult to tell. So, I mean, if you, if you think of it in terms of classical tree decomposition, it is like, uh, like trying to, I mean, if you attempt to decompose a structure with a width that is smaller than its actual tree width. Yeah. So you will always need to generate new bags. But uh, the fact that you know that there is uh, I mean, that, that there is a finite width in which you can fit it in, and uh, I mean, you will end up in a. I mean, so to get a bound on how, how big you should take the, bag, the, the bags to, to, to get, again, a finite structure, this is subtle. And, uh, well, actually, it turns out that, I mean, well, after, after many years, um, there, so Barani and Gottlob and Otto came up with this theorem that I called magic theorem yesterday. And that says that if I have uh, a graph over finitely many guarded isomorphism types, and, uh, this is the, the invariant of the Ehrenfeld Fixé graph, then I can reconstruct a finite model. And um, so what this will tell us is that if I take such a finite, I mean, if I take a finite graph, maybe not its in reveling alone will give us uh, a, a finite model. But I mean, there will be another finite graph that I will get by partial unraveling that fits me into, so if I have here the finite structures, So I have a companion. Right, this is just uh, the invariant that I can unravel in a controlled way so that via the tree, I will end up into something finite. And um, well, this, this argument is combinatorially complex. And I, I did not understand it yet well enough to, to be able to tell about it. but. Uh, I mean, the, the satisfaction algorithm is, yeah, the finite satisfaction algorithm is, is incredibly simple in the end. So we take the, the automaton that we used to decide satisfiability in general, and then we think of it as an, as an automaton that works on graphs. And if it accepts a finite graph, we are done. And um, actually, well, we will not only get a model, but I mean, we will get also a, a quite small model. So it's a model of exponential size, or well, double exponential, I think, in the case of unbounded width. So this is the end of the story uh, for finite satisfiability. Yeah. Uh, we can decide satisfiability and finite satisfiability for the click guarded fragment uh, with the same complexity as we can do it for, um, well, the fragment without fixed points. So uh, we get the recursion mechanism for free. And that is something very nice. Now, uh, well, I, I can talk a bit about some extensions. Um, show that the area is still alive. One extension is regarded second order logic. 
So what we do here is we, I mean, one way to define this is to say we allow arbitrary um, second order quantification, but then we restrict the, the core, so the first order part, to guarded formula. And um, it turns out, so this is in a way, uh, I mean, if we think of graphs, it's like allowing to speak about the incident structure instead of, of the graph, or it has, and uh, so with this semantics, we get uh, lifting theorem. So, um, if I take guarded second order, so in some sense we want it to to correspond to monadic second order. But instead of speaking of uh, of nodes, we will speak of guarded tuples. And we know that monadic second order. If we take the by simulation invariant fragment, we get the mu calculus. Now, for guarded second for other logic, if we take the guarded by simulation fragment, we get guarded fixed point logic. It somehow suggests that uh, this is a, a healthy formalism. Uh, then. Another development is to look at um, simultaneous fixed point variant. So with the Mercalculus, uh, it is usual to define it as a system of equations, and then um, we we get an alternative uh, syntax for for the guarded. Uh, so for guarded logics, I mean there is a way to do guarded fragment with um, so simultaneous. And this seemed to capture p time on as long as we are interested only in guarded by simulation invariant properties. Um, what? So another extension is to notice that, I mean, it started with noticing that if we take guarded fixed point formula, for example, and we add, um, I mean, something that is quite safe if you want to look for decidable fragments of first order. So you, you take an existen you add existential quantification for, uh, I mean, with one variable. You don't leave, leave more than one variable free. Then you get still a decidable fragment. And I mean, the, the insight or the generalization of this insight is that actually it is not that important that quantification is guarded, but I mean, what 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 is uh, relevant is that whenever we change between universal and uh, existential quantification, we we need to keep our free variables on uh, on on guarded tuples, and then uh, so the the extension, I mean, this uh, guarded fragment with uh, well, guarded negation fragment. It imposes uh, syntactic restriction on on using negation. It's like whenever you, n you use negation, you you have to to uh, keep the free variables on on guarded tuples. And all the algorithms that we have for the guarded fragment, they they survive with a little more care. So this is uh, I mean guarded second order logic. This is work of Hirsch and uh, Orto. It's 2000. This is work of Otto, and the um, guarded negation. This is um, Ten uh, Segufan, Balder Tenkate. Okay, 
And um, well, I mean, I, I mentioned this because the techniques that are used in in these approaches are, are all essentially what we have seen. I mean, it's all about um, well uh, using by simulation invariance so that you can get to automata and then reproduce the proofs that you have for MSO or for the calculus. Okay, so um, I, uh, this is how much I had to say. <laughs> Thank you.